right from the top, let me dissuade you from watching this video. I 100% do not want you to watch this video if you're looking for quick answers. For once, I'm going to indulge in my baser nerdum and take us into your cells. Yours, not mine, because it sounds painful. So I'm volunteering your cells. And I'm gonna describe multiple mechanisms outlined by these two scientific reviews on how omega-3 fats affect your cells and therefore your health. I will go over no clinical data and instead focus only on some wildly cool mechanisms that I'll bet that you've never heard before. But if you're interested in the clinical data, don't worry, I'll link my work on that later. For now, let's go into some of the mechanisms only. Real quick, if I see a comment asking how to apply this information or you talk too much, get to the point, just know that I'm reading your comments looking like this. Is this how you want me to look at you? <sighs> the first mechanism is the effect omega-3s have on dyslipidemia which is an abnormal level of blood lipids, fats. It's been shown before that omega-3s reduce our blood fat levels, which is linked to improved health. But exactly how do they do that? Well, let's start by understanding how your cells generate triglycerides, fats. Inside your cells is an organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum, a protein called SREBP, or sterile regulatory element binding protein is found embedded in the membrane of that organelle. When stimulated by low cholesterol or fat inside the cells, SREBP is activated. So let me pause here and point out that there are other activators like insulin resistance as well. So when activated, SREBP is chaperoned and moved to another organelle called the Golgi apparatus by a protein called SCAP. When these proteins are embedded into the Golgi's membrane, SREBP is cleaved or cut, so a soluble free form of the protein can now move into the nucleus of your cells. Here, it binds to many genes that contain a sequence or section of DNA called the sterile response element. This sequence is usually found next to genes related to triglyceride synthesis and cholesterol management inside the cells. These are called lipogenic genes, which produce enzymes that allow for more triglyceride formation in this instance. So let me emphasize that what I just told you is a, still a simplification. And depending on the context, SREBP activity is a good thing to have. But in this dyslipidemic situation with higher blood triglycerides, it's a negative to our health. Okay, so where do omega-3s fit into this? Well, you might already know that omega-3s are polyunsaturated fats. And according to the researchers of this review, omega-3s can find their way into the nucleus and bind these sterile response elements that attract the uh, soluble SREBP and thereby inhibit them. This is called competitive binding. Additionally, omega-3s have the ability to destabilize messenger RNA. What does that mean? Well, let's pick up uh, back where SREBP was bound to the sterile response element, recruited gene-reading proteins like RNA polymerase, and this uh, RNA polymerase is now reading the lipogenic, so remember that's the triglyceride-producing genes. When the RNA polymerase is reading these genes, it isn't just reading them for educational purposes, it's transcribing what is encoded in the gene into another molecule called a messenger RNA. This messenger RNA would normally be released out of the nucleus where most of the genes are kept and be translated into a functional protein. However, messenger RNAs, or mRNAs for short, are not very stable molecules, and the cell can regulate how much of these mRNAs get translated into functional proteins through a number of mechanisms that, well, I won't burden you with right now. But the overall outcome is that mRNA gets degraded, destroyed, instead of producing a protein. Essentially, mRNA gets targeted by proteins called ribonucleases, which cut up and destroy the mRNA. So 
If something could destabilize the mRNA, the lipogenic proteins, the enzymes, would never be made, and the cell won't produce more triglycerides. As you likely guessed, omega-3s destabilize the mRNA. Exactly how? Well, if it's through indirect means by activating mRNA de degradation machinery, or if that's likely through binding mRNA directly, I'm not really sure. So, there we have some mechanisms by which omega-3s could lower triglycerides. That's pretty damn cool, isn't it? But are there other mechanisms that don't involve triglycerides? I mean, keep in mind that omega-3s effect on uh, blood triglycerides are dependent on dose. So could there be some other mechanisms afoot? Well, there are. If you watch or educate yourself otherwise on health, you likely also know that insulin resistance, a state wherein your cells no longer uh, respond to the hormone insulin normally is, well, bad for you. <laughs> I, I have a chuckle here because it's just such a simple, almost stupid way of talking. Insulin resistance is bad for you, okay? Anyway, Omega-3s seem to have an effect on the mechanisms of insulin resistance as well. But first, let's discuss some of the mechanisms of insulin resistance without omega-3s. So inside insulin resistant cells, there can be an accumulation of fatty acids or fat molecules, similar to the triglycerides that we discussed earlier. And these fatty acids can be converted to two primary molecules, DAGs or diacylglycerols and ceramides. An accumulation of DAGs can lead to the activation of a protein called protein kinase C, PKC for the tired tongue. PKC translocates, the science term for moves, but we're scientists, damn it. We need to use the most confusing words possible. PKC, bound to DAG, moves to the cell membrane. There, it binds the insulin receptor and phosphorylates, or TAGs, the insulin receptor. This tagging of the insulin receptor inhibits, stops, the insulin receptor for translating the binding of the insulin hormone on the outside of the cell into actionable consequences inside the cell. Effectively, it stops translating insulin signaling, which is a literal insulin resistance. In addition, though, ceramides can inhibit downstream proteins in the insulin cascade. So let's assume that the insulin hormone binds to the exterior of the cell and the insulin receptor propagates, so continues, that signal into the cell. Normally, it would activate a protein called IRS. This IRS protein, which is not related to taxes, would then activate an important protein called AKT. AKT would then further propagate that signal and eventually lead to the removal of blood sugar into the cell to feed the cell and thus the insulin cascade functions, simplistically explained. However, when ceramides are elevated, they inhibit AKT, thereby stopping the insulin cascade halfway through. All of this ultimately leads to higher blood sugar over time, and that has its own consequences on health, like elevated glycation. So that's a topic for another time. Just know that it's bad, okay? All right, where do omega-3s fit into this? Well, aside from their direct effect on reducing fatty acid levels through SREBP mechanisms that we discussed, omega-3s also bind to a receptor called GPR120. This receptor, when activated, inhibits inflammatory pathways that ultimately lead to the production of pro-inflammatory molecules known as cytokines. Since fatty acids generating DAGs, or DAG, diacylglycerols, and ceramides aren't the only way that the insulin receptor can be shut down, inflammatory cytokines can also bind receptors on the cell and cause similar inhibitions of the insulin receptor. So if omega-3s can bind this GPR-120 and dissuade the production of cytokines, it can relieve the insulin receptor. Naturally, there's about 10 steps that I've left out, but the takeaway here is that there are many mechanisms by which omega-3s affect our cellular health. If you'd like to hear more mechanisms, including all my other work on the topic, I cover more in the extended version of this video, which is accessible to the Physionic Insiders if you care to join there. It's linked in the description. 
Alternatively, I cover one more mechanism, including the clinical data on actual outcomes and more in these follow-up videos right here. So choose whichever is the most interesting to you. Thanks for nerding out with me and I'll speak with you over there.